So uh, hello everyone and welcome to our first event of our Copyright for Open Science uh, series. In this, uh, in this event today, we're going to focus on the European context of copyright reform for open science. And it's moderated by our legal counsel, Prodromos Chavos. And uh, I'm going to get you started with uh, some quick housekeeping notes. So as you were just alerted, this session will be recorded. After our session, we will make the recording uh, publicly available and it will be sent to all registrants. So during uh, the discussions, we kindly ask you to keep your cameras and microphones off to avoid any noise. But once we get to the, the Q&A, uh, you're free to unmute and turn on your camera if you would like. And also, please put any comments, thoughts uh, or questions you have uh, on the chat and we will make sure to address them. If you're tweeting about the session, you can use the copyright C4OS and tag open air. Feel free to do that if you would like. And with those quick notes, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Prodromos to, quick, to quickly introduce our speakers for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Athena. And thank you everyone for being with us tonight. Um, I feel quite privileged to be amongst the distinguished colleagues that uh, we have with us today. Uh, to talk about an issue which frankly is uh, something we keep discussing I think in different guises for the past 20 years which is how can we uh, truly have open science what is the kind of legislative framework that we need to have in order to achieve that and the impetus for our discussion today uh, has been um, a series of uh, legal instruments new legal instruments uh, that we have in Europe, uh, which try to support open science and open access in different forms. Uh, and uh, the question we very frequently discuss is to what extent are these new instruments uh, uh, relevant or how, to what extent can they truly support open science, uh, or to what extent do, do we need a more substantial uh, copyright reform, especially in the area of limitations and exceptions. Uh, I would also like to say that this series started as a result of uh, discussions we had as open air um, with uh, John Wilinski uh, in the context of, of how uh, limitations and the limitations and exception system could be reformed. Uh, so his model is, is one of the things we, we may be discussing today. Uh, but don't forget that this is the first one in a series of webinars where we're going to be focusing on the European context. Whereas uh, in our next webinar, uh, our focus is going to be uh, the uh, Americas and the United Systems, uh, United States system in particular. And finally, we conclude the series uh, with uh, a meeting which is going to be about the global perspective in relation to the same uh, thing. Um, so, without further ado, I would like you, uh, I would like to share with you uh, and introduce you to our speakers. So, I'll go very quickly and, and just give you uh, just a glimpse of who they are and what they do. They have quite lengthy uh, CVs, so I'll, I'll try to be. Uh, I would ask them to forgive me for being so succinct about what they have. And I'll start with Alea Lopez de San Roman. And Alea is a legal and policy officer at the European Commission's Directorate for Research and Innovation. Uh, she works in the Open Science Unit, where she contributes to the development and implementation of the EU policy on open science with a focus on an EU uh, copyright and data legislative framework fit for research and open access to scientific results. Um, so, uh, hi, Alea. Um, we also have together with us Ignacy Labastida, uh, who has a PhD in physics from the University of Barcelona. I didn't know that about you, Ignacy. Uh, he's the head of the Office for the Dissemination of Knowledge and the Research Support Unit at the Cry Library of the same university, and he's currently chairing the Information and Open Access Policy Group at the LERU and the board of, of Spark Europe. Uh, and Ignacy is also very well known for his work uh, with Creative Commons. He's uh, initiated the project in uh, back in 2003, and he's one of the leading figures of the movement in the past two uh, decades. And uh, then uh, we have also the great honor to have with us uh, Professor Caso, Roberto Caso, uh, who is a co-director of Trento Law Tech Group and Associate Professor of Comparative Private Law at University of Trento Faculty of Law, where he teaches civil law, comparative intellectual property law, comparative privacy law, copyright law and arts, and uh, copyright. Uh, he's also the author and editor of publications in the field of intellectual property, privacy, contract and tort law, and also president of the Italian Association for the promotion of open science. 
Um, now moving to to the industry, we have we have the great uh, pleasure to have uh, two leading figures with us. With us, we have uh, Rod Cookson, uh, and Rod uh, runs IWA Publishing, which is one of the first Lens Society publishers to complete the transition its journals to open access using both subscribe to open and APC model. He is a director of, of OASBA, as council member of Society's Publishers Coalition and a member of the Royal Society's Publishing Board and has previously served as director of ALPSP. Uh, so uh, great to have you with us, Rod. And then I move to uh, Roger van uh, Zvanenberg, and I hope that I pronounce your name correctly, Roger. Uh, and uh, Roger fought Pluto Journal's 21 International science, Social Science Journals into open access in January 2021. And... Uh, as he says, uh, and I'll, I'll read his statement, during 2021, 99% of the money promised by uh, Pluto intermediaries, uh, knowledge uh, unlatched was collected, uh, doing only 33% of the money promised uh, was collected. Uh, Pluto Journal's future is now uncertain. Open access for SSH journals is clearly a hit or miss business at the heart of the problem is copyright. So Roger, we will return to this, uh, to your statement later. And finally, last but not least, uh, my good friend, Thomas Margoni, uh, prof who is a research professor of intellectual property law at the Faculty of Law and Criminology, KU Levin, and a member of the board, board of directors of the Center of IT and IP Law. Uh, and uh, Thomas's research is mostly uh, on the relation, concentrates on the relationship between law, data, and technology. And uh, he's currently focusing on changes in the creation, access, transformation, distribution of knowledge and information brought by technologies like the internet and the uh, and artificial intelligence. So uh, quite uh, a, a distinguished uh, set of people with us tonight. And I'll start with Alea. And uh, I'll pose again the, the question that I, I mentioned I, uh, at the beginning. Uh, we've seen a lot of legislative uh, activity in Europe over the past uh, five years, but with great intensity uh, over the last couple of years. And I'm wondering, to what extent do you think this legislative uh, activity actually contributes to resolving some, resolving some of the issues that open science uh, stakeholders face? Alia, to you. Thank you very much, Prodramos. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, a pleasure to be here to talk about open science and copyright. So indeed, uh, there are many, uh, it's quite broad to talk about legislation that has an impact on open science, open access, and also about copyright legislation, uh, whether that is useful indeed. Uh, from the European Commission, as you know, open science is a key priority. And we have been pushing in many fronts towards open science, also in the legislative front, of course. So, for example, if we take concrete uh, areas, so concrete examples, as a funder, we have many hats. As a funder, we have this Horizon Europe, the funding program for research and innovation that currently has 95.5 billion. And then we have the obligations that we impose legally on our beneficiaries to provide immediate open access to the publications that result from their actions under CC BY license. So this is a concrete example of how legal obligations that they have really contribute to open access. We have a very good uptake of this open access mandate. We also have recommendations that we formulated to the member states on how they should act, uh, manage the scientific information, included open access to publications and research data in 2018 and we engage with the member states in reporting and monitoring how they are evolving and developing open access policies and strategies at the national level and then also another example for example of legislation that has contributed to advance open access is the article 10 in the open data directive in 2019 in which for publicly funded research data Member states have an obligation to have an open access policy to provide open access by default, always allowing for exceptions. It's what we call as open as possible, as close as necessary. And then to articulate, articulate national action plans. And this data, when publicly funded and publicly available via repositories, shall be reusable for commercial and non-commercial purposes. So those are three concrete examples, our policy to our beneficiary, as a funder, 
the 2018 recommendation, non-binding but still a legal instrument, and the 2019 Open Data Directive of how legislation on our side has helped uh, to advance open science in different areas, open access mainly to scientific publications and fair research uh, data. Uh, you are muted, Brother Mosk. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> and, and do you see um, changes in the or um, the uh, the new rules, let's say, in relation to copyright limitations and exceptions, particularly in relation to text and data mining, helping in the same direction? Changes in which sense? So, with regard to the copyright in the DSM uh, directive. I would mm -hmm. say that it's still early. So uh, as we know, it was adopted in 2019 to be implementing transpose at the national level by June, if I remember correctly, 2021. But as we know, some member states are still they in haven't. transposition, in yeah. the process of transposition. So I would say it's still early to, um, to talk about the effect on effects. We can see some trends maybe, but it's still uh, premature. Uh, so that is what I would say in that regard. Uh, thanks very much, Alea. And I'll, I'll pass now to Ignasi uh, Lavastida uh, to tell us what is your perspective from from uh, from a library, uh, from the library side. To what extent? What are the kinds of uh, reforms you would see as essential in order to support open science as it happens today? Okay. Hello, every, everyone. Thanks for the invitation, and hello, Pro. Do we know? For many years, as you said before, with all the Creative Commons project, with Thomas also. Uh, let me put not just the, the library hat, let me put the university hat. And uh, one of the problems we're facing nowadays, uh, you mentioned all these legislative actions or activities from the, the commission. Sometimes we've seen from the point of view of the university that other uh, DGs, not just research, are making changes, especially for data, that also affects universities, uh, for instance, with uh, repositories or this kind of platforms, when they try to uh, put some uh, conditions to other, uh, um, let's say, players that are sharing or using our data, that sometimes make for us more difficult. Uh, and we always are trying to as for uh, exceptions for research, exceptions for research performance organization, etc. So that's one of the things that I would like to stress that sometimes uh, where there are some changes in the law that are thinking for more commercial players, sometimes it affects uh, also uh, universities. And it's something that it's uh, for us, it's uh, complicated. Saying that, uh, from the point of view of, of open science, uh, I think from the university perspective is that, I think Alea just mentioned it, is when we have like a, a struggle between, uh, I mean, we, we would like to share all our knowledge more quickly, etc. But we are always in this uh, struggling because uh, we have, pro uh, by using copyright, when we publish, uh, we have these uh, conditions of the uh, publishers, but on the other hand, we have the funders with these requirements, and that's why we, uh, many universities nowadays are discussing about how we could retain the rights and uh, be compliant with both things. So, trying to figure out how we can use copyright in a way that we can, uh, on one hand, uh, follow uh, the publication system, but on the other hand comply uh, with the requirements of being open and just in the first moment of publication. So I think the, it's not like we need a, 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 a radical reform of copyright. It's that I think we need to use copyright in, in such uh, uh, a different way or, or to try to figure out how to use it properly to make uh, the publication system more sustainable and viable and to, at the same moment, share our knowledge. And of course, we have been struggling with the license for many years nowadays, but uh, still we have a, a lot of misunderstandings, misuses of the license that makes things also complicated. Uh, and, and of course, from the point of view of, of an institution also, I think we need also clarification uh, from who owns the copyright, who can uh, decide which is the license or the others. Uh, we know that there are some disciplines that like more one license than the others. So all these things, is uh, the issues that I think we need to 
to manage and to find some balances to make uh, what we want at the end, that is open, open science, so not just open access for publications, but also for data and any output that comes from the research. Many thanks, Ignacy. And, and I, I will return to, to this uh, discussion about copyright retention, which I think is, a, is an interesting topic, an interesting model uh, in, in the second round of questions. Uh, so thanks for, for this point, which is how I would I would rephrase that my question to be, to what extent can we uh, use the copyright system and the other legislative uh, instruments we have, particularly um, uh, the open data, uh, directive uh, to see uh, something which makes sense and is usable for open science stakeholders. And and with this uh, thing in mind, I will go and, and pass the floor to Rhodes um, to tell us what it means from the side of a publisher uh, to actually be active in the area of open science. So what would you see as your major obstacle and, and your biggest opportunity in terms of the current legislative framework in, in Europe? Rhodes. Thanks, uh, thanks, Prodromos. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really helpful introduction from Ignacy and uh, Ilea. Um, I, I think I'd start by talking about how copyright works at the moment and how that that looks from the perspective of a, a scientific publisher. Um, you know, we, we are a learned society publisher, IWA Publishing. We're, we're very mission focused. That's our primary responsibility. Um, in the world we operate, um, there are two legacy ways that we have generated money to sustain um, the journals we publish. You know, one is obviously subscriptions, where you know copyright is the foundation, um, and that the subscription model is based on the idea that libraries pay for uh, time limited, geographically limited access to journals. Um, and the the sort of relatively more recent idea is is the idea of the APC and open access, where um, the commercial value of um, the copyright in an article is paid for to enable it to become open access. Um, those those are both quite good models for um, generating lucrative commercial publishing businesses, and that kind of is the function they have they have served over years. They're good for publishers generally in that um, they're fairly durable. They they persist year to year, so they kind of. They provide a, a basis for long-term planning, which is, is very important. What they are not so good at is providing a basis for purely open science, which I think is where we're interested in, in going with the discussion. So my publishing house and also Roger um, Van Zannenberg, who's who's on this call, um, has had a similar um, experiment, has, has, has got 15 journals we publish. Five of those were open access um, by two years ago. And we decided to make the remaining 10 journals open access using a model called subscribe to open. And that is a rather different philosophical approach to subscriptions or AP APCs. And with subscribe to open, what we have done is we've gone to university libraries, asked them to keep supporting us and said in exchange, if enough of them support us, we'll make those 10 journals open access with no fees for authors to publish and no fees for readers to read. So it's completely equitable open access. Um, it's you know it's a collective active system. So it's um, it's very it's very good in terms of uh, being part of the community. It's very good in terms of enabling scientific discourse. You know if you look at subscriptions, the entire point, the design of the subscription system is that it interrupts access. If you don't pay, you don't get access. So it's completely out of kilter with how researchers want to work and how researchers do work. And the APC system you know, has virtues in that it creates a lot of open content. But again, it's very good for those who have funding to pay APCs. It's not very good for those who don't. So it's a, again, by design, inequitable system. Um, subscribe to open gets past both of those, those questions. Um, and in our experience, it's been a very good, a very good model. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about the detail of our experience. Where copyright comes into it is we still have um, a legal framework where the value generated within our business is typically from either renting copyright material, the subscription, or paying APCs to get outright ownership, as it were, or you know, freeing of copyright material. Um, whereas what we think would be much more helpful would be if groups of libraries, if if groups of funders could come together and agree mechanisms for funding socially useful publishing. For having criteria for deciding 
um, where revenue should be allocated um, and support models like the subscribe to open model that we um, we pursue, um, which we think is much better aligned with the research community um, and give those kind of emerging models, which um, sit rather differently via the copyright um, to subscriptions and to APCs um, and enable those models to become really, really strong long term methods for many publishers um, in scientific research to publish journals and perhaps books in future. Many thanks, Rod. And I'll, I'll return to these uh, different models. And, and uh, I, I understand that we have, you're suggesting something uh, in, in principle, your approach, I would say, is very similar to Ignatius in the sense that what you're advocating is not uh, radical legal reform, but instead uh, being truly innovative in the way we are actually deploying the existing system, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, um, there may be um, sort of genuinely differently constructed futures that result from changes in the legal framework now, which take perhaps decades to fully come to fruition. And I think there are, there are shorter term changes that can be affected by using money which is already being spent by universities and by funders and using that money in a more collectively useful way, a more constructive way um, to produce good open, open access outcomes now and move research publishing significantly further forward, significantly quicker than it's moving at the present time. So yeah, I think that's that's very much in the same space as uh, Ignacy's comments. M many thanks, Rod, and I'll, I'll keep this time element. I'll return uh, to this in the second round. And, and now I'll pass the floor to Roger. And uh, Roger, when when I read the statement, you, you were very clear that you think copyright lies at the heart of the problem. Uh, do you think we, we can cope with it? Can we uh, develop uh, innovative business models that actually end licensing models or contractual arrangements or funding agreements that can, can help us tweak the, uh, uh, the, the, the problem and manage somehow to go ahead? Or do we need uh, copyright reform? Thank you very much indeed for asking me onto this panel. Um, <clears throat> I've been a publisher now for... 45 years, and therefore I've been using copyright um, all that time. Copyright um, uh, is basically um, commodifies uh, production of writing and artworks um, and allows both the author to sell his work or her work without losing basic ownership, and it allows publishers um, to act, and that is in the pre-digital age. So copyright originates before the digital age came about. Digital communication alters commodification of an author's work, and especially in open access. Open access makes commodification nearly worthless. It turns the old mechanisms on its head. When a publication of any kind is open, it hugely increases the readership. And what happens is a mega loss of income. So these two things suddenly become opposing each other, which is totally unusual in any form of capitalist organization. When you get an increase in demand, you expect to get an increase in income. The exact opposite happens in open access. And that has been our experience so far. There are particular circumstances to our experience which might make it unusual. And that I'm not sure of at the moment. And that is why I personally became very much in favor of John Mozensky's proposals, because they take they take a look at the entire um, copyright situation and try and alter it in its totality. And that seems to me the way to go about this. Um, so that small publishers, in particularly in the social sciences and the humanities, aren't faced with a nearly impossible situation, which is what they are at the moment. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Roger. 
Uh, and, and I'm really glad that you're bringing uh, John Wilinski's proposal on the table. I see uh, Professor Wilinski is with us tonight as well. I'm really glad to, to see him in the uh, uh, in the participants in, since, as I said before, he was uh, the reason why we started this whole series. Um, Roger, can you further elaborate on why uh, do you think uh, the model proposed by, by John uh, is one uh, which it, it makes sense it's, the, it's a solution. Uh, what are the constituent elements of, of such a statutory license? Well, it, it, <coughs> uh, that's uh, Professor well, Walensky suggests that John you think makes sense for, for a publisher. John's proposal puts responsibility uh, onto the libraries for this, for the defining which, uh, in, in our case, uh, which journals should be accepted into open access and therefore provides security of payment. And this is one of the most difficult issues is the security of the future going into open access. It is possible to take a small number of journals into open access and keep the majority um, in, in the, on the old platform. Uh, and that gives um, many publishers security, but it has been so slow and so diverse. And there's been so many different models of open access because the system is chaotic. And it's chaotic because at its very heart, is this question of commodification and open access takes commodification, removes commodification and makes something public. And that is what is so very important in this whole movement. And that's why I think John Wilensky should be supported in every possible way. Many thanks, Roger. And and, and with this, with this uh, tone, I'll pass to uh, our legal scholar, scholars, initially to uh, Roberto, uh, to ask him pretty much the same question. To what extent do you think we need to uh, go for a more active reform of the copyright system or to work um, uh, in, in with the existing system in order to devise licensing or contractual models uh, to uh, address the, uh, the issues we are facing uh, in, in the open science context. And I'll, I'll also uh, bring forward again, the point made by, by Rod uh, that this is a time question as well. So how fast can we be? Even if we wish practically to have a legal reform, uh, it may be uh, a good cause and uh, necessary but indeed we need to do something now. And in that sense, we need to think how we develop our funders and uh, licensing models. Roberto. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prodromos. Um, let me start with the, with the joke. Uh, all I want for Christmas is more uh, academic freedom and academic autonomy. Uh, I think this is the most important uh, uh, issue in the field of open science, because we are um, um, we are facing a, a giant contradiction. Uh, on the, on the one end, we we face an expanding regime of intellectual property, not only at uh, uh, copyright uh, law level, but also, for example, uh, at uh, patent law level. <clears throat> On the other end, we 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 uh, are trying to expand the legislation about open science, uh, for example, in the field of copyright law and in the field of uh, <clears throat> data re regulation. So we, in the in the next years, I think we we uh, have to solve this uh, uh, contradiction, and. Uh, I think it, it is important to, to focus our attention on the, uh, the implications in terms of academic freedom and academic autonomy. From this point of view, I think uh, uh, a, a good example of uh, uh, radical reform at uh, um, European Union uh, copyright law level could be the introduction of uh, a right to open uh, uh, to open uh, publication. I am talking about a right to open publication because. Oh, yeah, no, no. Uh,
because we are talking uh, uh, now about the secondary publication right, but, pro pro but probably framing uh, this right in terms of secondary publication uh, right is, uh, a, a not, is not the correct way to frame the, 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 the issue. Because uh, <clears throat> if we talk about a secondary publication right, probably we we uh, we are talking about uh, um, a sort of exception or limitations to copyright. For example, this is the the way of framing the issues uh, by Christina Angelopoulos on, on, in the in the last study about uh, uh, about the matter. Uh, but I'm thinking a, a radical reform in terms of uh, um, a right of author, not subject to the um, uh, to the uh, legislation framework of exception and limitations, for example, the, 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 the three-step test. If, uh, um, if we uh, can reason about the right to open publication in terms of uh, uh, a, a sort of moral right, because it's a, a, a pillar of academic freedom and academic autonomy, uh, probably this is the correct way to imagine a, a reform of uh, uh, copyright law uh, uh, in favor of academic freedom and academic autonomy. Because uh, historically, uh, the, uh, the idea of the ownership of the, uh, copyright on the uh, scientific articles, books, and, and et cetera, was uh, uh, in effect one of the fundamental piece of academic freedom. This is only an example, obviously, because we are all conscious that uh, the reform also at copyright Reva, also a radical reform of copyright law, it is not sufficient. It is not sufficient to reach um, a, a real open access and open science system. Um, we are uh, we are talking about also the control of the uh, infrastructure. Uh, we are talking uh, uh, about also the control of the data um, by university and research institutions. We are talking about also uh, the research uh, assessment uh, reform. And uh, I, I, I think European Union Commission um, is uh, working very well because uh, because the uh, uh, European Union Commission is working on the infrastructure, public infrastructure, is working on the uh, uh, research assessment reform. But uh, at the national level, uh, the uh, patchwork is very, very complex, and the situation in each state member is very different. For example, in Italy, we don't have uh, effectively, uh, an effective uh, um, open access and open science policies. We, we have a, a national plan in, uh, for, uh, the, the, for fostering uh, open science in Italy, but uh, we don't have uh, any uh, effective tools uh, in order to implement this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. And I'm really glad that we, uh, we have on the table uh, a, a pretty radical proposal, I would say. And, and, and just to summarize what you, you've said, so you're suggesting to have a positive right to open uh, that is uh, granted to the authors as a, more, a form of a moral right, as an expression of academic freedom, and not to rely on secondary publishing through a limitations and exception system, which pr frankly wouldn't work uh, because it would be uh, too limited. So uh, in order to secure things, you would go for a contract or a license. And, and I think uh, Roberto's point is, is a very interesting one. I think it, it relates to what Roger mentioned before, um, and so perhaps in, we will have the opportunity either in this panel or, or, or another uh, one in the second one um, to, to have the opportunity to compare this proposal to um, uh, John's proposal, uh, because this is also uh, requires legal reform to see what are the, the, the commonalities uh, between, between the two. Um, but I, I'll take the, uh, my inspiration from Roberto uh, to pass to Thomas and uh, um, 
one of the of the things that uh, Roberto was saying is, is precisely uh, that um, uh, we we have all this legislation and it happens at the European level and it's very positive, but it's still extremely fragmented at the national level and it doesn't necessarily uh, have neither the policy uh, elements there nor the legal ones. Uh, what is your experience? To what extent do you see uh, the uh, the different legal um, uh, reforms happening? At initially first of all if they are adequate or not and secondly how do you see that at the european level do you see this trickling down to the member states or is it still something which very much happens at the union level and and, and the results are still far away uh from the uh, national uh legal systems thank you prodromos uh of course thank you for the invitation and for having me uh, I thank you less uh, for the question. How am I supposed to answer that? Uh, if I was able to offer you a convincing answer, I think that, uh, um, I don't know, I, I would win uh, the famous uh, $1 million prize, right? I was um, hoping I was hoping this panel would be that, but not this, <laughs> not, this not tonight. Perhaps it happens. I haven't seen any check next, in my invitation. Next, uh, next time. So... Um, I think that the, there are a number of uh, of elements that uh, you know emerged from the previous discussion, uh, which I will use to try to answer your question. Um, one, uh, I think, is uh, you know uh, the academic publishing industry, uh, and probably the mistake is to use the singular. It seems to me that uh, there is no uh, a, one single model, and it seems to me that. Uh, the examples that you have we have just heard from Rod and and Roger are you know are not uh, the kind of uh, evil academic publishing that uh, many of us have been uh, uh, hearing of or speaking about uh, in the last years right um and here of course uh, it's uh, it's a first distinction to make um you know one thing is if you're talking to someone who's trying to you know develop a sustainable model where they are willing to give up uh, this uh, famous concept of control that uh, property rights should afford you uh, in, in a way that uh, that uh, you know is trying to is attempting to achieve some sort of more equitable i think you said rod uh, uh, solution now of course if the terms of the com of the of the debate are these, uh, you could uh, approach the problem from a certain angle. If you're talking uh, to a different type of, uh, you know, publishing industry that uh, have, uh, um, how do we say, uh, less uh, willingness to uh, commit on this uh, uh, changing market and social uh, uh, dynamics and technological dynamics, then of course the question, uh, the terms of the questions are, are different, right? So I think that, uh, uh, this is a first element to consider, because uh, if the situation is uh, multifaceted, then probably there is no, or it is less likely that one solution would fit uh, all uh, uh, problems. I, I, th th this doesn't really lead us to any specific uh, uh, proposal, at least in my, you know, rough notes that I've taken, but I think that this is one aspect that uh, I have uh, heard uh, so far. Um, then should we save the publishers? Because of course, uh, the, 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 the trend that we have seen uh, in, in, in the recent uh, debate is uh, one that uh, perhaps want to avoid the question because of course is a difficult and tricky question, but if the argument as it goes is that uh, technology and uh, and socioeconomical development have led to a situation where the role of the publisher is not as clear as it was uh, you know 20 40 years ago when there was a clear need for a medium that conveyed knowledge so the printing of the copy and the distribution of the copy because uh, if we go back in time that was the only way in which we we could uh, uh, have access uh, to knowledge and uh, um, there is some interesting work made on the history of uh, scholarly publishing uh, that uh, shows how back in time uh, the interest of the first publishing uh, and learned societies 
uh, was uh, in distributing more and they didn't really care about if uh, someone made copies they wanted to retain a different type of control that had much more to do with uh, uh, the quality and the prestige of the publication and much less with the reproduction of the individual copy um, right now of course the internet and digital technologies as in many other uh, areas of the creative industries have uh, put this paradigm under um, a considerable stress so the question and I think that's the question that uh, um, many of us and that John but also uh, um, uh, Jean-Claude Guedon have asked uh, is the right question what is what space is left for commercial uh, academic publishing because if we don't ask this question we can you know go around the, the 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 term of our of our inquiry as much as we want but there is there cannot be a legal solution to a problem that we are not able to define correctly right um and just to be clear i do think that there is some space left but is a space that is very different from the one that at cert at, at least a certain you know type b industry publishing uh, is uh, occupying right now um If we decide to save the publishing industry, and there are certainly, uh, you know, a, a second uh, aspect here to consider that the publishing industry is not only different depending on the nature of the of the um, of the firm, so to speak, behind them, but also on the field where publishing is done. Uh, hard and STEM sciences uh, may follow different type of incentives than uh, social and humanities. Um, to run uh, a diamond uh, uh, open access uh, journal in the legal field uh, has a cost of thousand to thousand euros a year. Uh, you know, JP Tech does that, uh, and uh, that there is no need really for any form of uh, uh, um, commercial funding that goes beyond a small grant from a science foundation. This model probably, however, cannot be borrowed in uh, in STEMs, where you know the kind of uh, uh, um, analysis and review and, and editing that is done by the publisher is of a different nature. Um, so that's maybe also another aspect that uh, that can can be considered in our assessment. Um, so I don't want to speak too long, but just very briefly around the uh, right exceptions and type of publications. I think that uh, Probably the best way to, you know, for the law to adjust to this uh, um, very uh, uh, multifaceted environment is to have a, a multifaceted approach. So we need the secondary publication rights, we need first publication rights, we need exceptions and we need rights. And they will work at different levels uh, and in different moments. And depending on different competencies, uh, going back to your initial question, I don't think that the commission uh, does A instead of B because, uh, or only because they think that A is uh, correct or opportune or right and B is not. Sometimes it is a matter of uh, what kind of attributions of power does uh, the European Union have and what other types of attribution of power remains with member states and therefore it's legally impossible for the commission to enter into a specific sector where they don't have competence right and that would for example have an impact on a strategy of uh, you know university retains uh, exclusive or an exclusive license or of their researchers that may work differently in different member states this area of law is not harmonized and therefore it would be impossible for the EU to harmonize it so also depending on how or on the specific solution that we identify there may be a need uh, to adjust the specific tool to the type of uh, uh, competence that either member states or uh, the European Union have. I have a couple of other notes, but I keep them for my uh, I'll stop second, you here, uh, <laughs> uh, round. Thank you very much. No, that has been quite rich. But and I'll, I'll, I'll take. Uh, I, I understand from your. Uh, point it was good that I left you at the end because you you made a kind of a synthesis of the different um, opinions we heard and positions. As I to didn't how... know what else to say. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, so I think this is um, this. You pose, however, the uh, the real question, which is uh, what kind of publishing 
do we need or what kind of publishing? And you mentioned commercial publishing. Uh, do we need for the open science era? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, start my second round, uh, paraphrasing slightly your question and, and asking Alea, what would you see uh, from your perspective as sustainable, as a sustainable model for publishing in the open science era? So if let's forget for, for a time being the specifics the mechanics of how we actually um, uh, resolve open science questions and how we can support open science and go uh, to the cracks of the matter. How, what would be the some constituent elements of a sustainable open science publishing model uh, today from, from what you see in terms of the commission's initiatives and policy? What are the elements there? Alea. Well, that is a very broad question, sustainability in the publishing system, I think. <laughs> um, but indeed, there can be some elements. So also, I, I think uh, a topic we are all discussing now is equity, how to bring more equity. Diversity is a, a key element in it. Uh, from the European Commission, uh, we are supporting, for example, institutional publishing and publishing in open access, trying to diversify also the publishing system. Also, a way in which there are not only restrictions to read, but also restrictions, no, no restrictions to publish. And then in the long term, as Thomas was mentioned, uh, mentioning this is multifaceted. There are so many aspects that need to be taken into account in order to talk about a sustainable publishing system. So I would say, and also bringing it a little bit back to the discussion today about copyright, how can this contribute? And I think also linked to what Thomas was mentioned before about the different options. Indeed, there are many different options that are being brought and also on our side, on the side of the European Commission, by the research and innovation stakeholders, the actors, the legal experts, what can be done in order to push uh, for open science and open access from different fronts and in different ways. And indeed, there are many solutions. So here, uh, there have been mentions to the proposal indeed by John Wilinski. Uh, Roberto was also making reference to the secondary publication right. There we can say how already five member states in the European Union, uh, France, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands and Belgium, if I'm correct, have already introduced so and have some positive experiences with them. And there have been calls by uh, scholars and professors such as uh, Roberto Caso, Julia Dore, but also Liber research libraries or the Ali academies this week about the possible introduction, but the calls about an introduction at the EU level or such a right. And different indeed rights retention strategies that were mentioned here and that funders have been positioned themselves with regard to those strategies, both at the funders level and at the institutional level. So. Also there, it's multifaceted, different approach, approaches that are being developed, trying to address different uh, issues. And on our side, we are considering that. So I was mentioning before in my first uh, intervention, different legislative approaches that we have had to legislative or legal approaches uh, to open access and open science. But also now we are working as part of the European research area agenda. So this European research area is this ambition to create a single market for research for the free circulation of knowledge in the EU that now has a legal basis in the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. So there we are trying to identify which barriers and challenges there are for access and reuse of publications and data in copyright and data and digital legislation. And on the basis of this identification to propose in consultation and coordination, of course, with other relevant services in the, in the commission, possible legislative and non-legislative measures to address them. And it's very interesting how we are analyzing and examining the many initiatives, each of them addressing different things. And hopefully the solutions to them will bring a more sustainable uh, publishing. And I could not only say publishing, but a scholarly communication system, which is much broader, much comprehensive, also more challenging. Uh, but I think this is where open science sits in a broader picture. Thank you very much, Alia. I think from, from you, you pretty much covered a, a, a extremely wide area of things uh, happening right now. I think the uh, the legal basis for the European research area is the most important development we had the recent years. And it's certainly something which will allow uh, this creation of a, a, a European space 
for knowledge to flow more effectively and efficiently. And I agree, uh, it's more about scholarly communication than just publishing. Um, and, and we, uh, as Open Air, will, will be there trying to also amplify uh, the message and also convey uh, different developments uh, happening in the area. This is really important. Uh, these are really important developments. Um, starting again from that uh, point that uh, Alia mentioned, uh, and, and going back to you, Ignasi, you mentioned the copyright retention by the universities as a possible strategy before. To what extent do you think this could lead to sustainable, um, um, let's say, scholarly communication, open scholarly communication? Well, I, I always say that at, at the end, uh, nothing is free. So uh, I think uh, from the point of view of uh, institutions, I think we, we are uh, committed to uh, sustain the scholarly communication system. I mean, we are committed to uh, share our our knowledge, and and let, let me know, let me say that in open science is not the academic knowledge; is the everyone's knowledge. I mean, we also participate with citizens. We have a lot of citizens science projects, and also we have to take care about that. How to deal with this? Because I think sometimes when we talk about open science, we forgot that open science doesn't mean only science created in the academia. So saying that, I think the, the problem here is that we are discussing, uh, like we were discussing years ago about the record industry. I mean, we have a problem. We have a problem of a business model. And I think this is a huge problem that we need to find how to manage that. Because I think what it, what is, we're going to a system that is not affordable for institutions, is not affordable for researchers. There's a problem of equity. So at the end, why we are looking for all these solutions, why we are looking to for preprints, why we are looking for publishing platforms. Because at the end, we're going back what we were wanted. We wanted to share knowledge. We want to explain our colleagues what we do, which our goal, which our outputs, etc. So I think it's uh, I think we have a problem if we keep sustaining one industry that is asking for things that are impossible. And uh, as Roberto was saying, the academic freedom is that I can choose. As a physicist, for 30 years, the physicists have chosen to use archive to say, these are my results. In fact, they don't need publishers. They publish there. The question, and I think Roberto and others have mentioned, is that how we assess the research, how we assess the quality. And be careful, because if the quality is not assessed anymore as a proxy that we have been using in the past, the publishing system is in, in danger because researchers have seen that they need to explain the results quickly. They need to share the results quickly. So if publishers keep saying, okay, this if you want to publish this result, you need to pay $10,000, the, the, the researchers will say, no, I will go to other places. So it's not a problem of, of copyright. It's not a problem of academic freedom. It's a problem of a system that is failing, is falling apart. And I think we need to, if we want something sustainable, I think what Rod was mentioning about the subscribe to open, um, models like John, we need to sit together and think which is a sustainable. Of course, we want services for peer review. We want services of editing. We know all these services and we have to, built together this service in an equity system, affordable system, and sustainable system. If not, everything will fail. Yes, uh, of course, one size doesn't fit all, and not all publishers work in the same way. Uh, I'll go very quickly to, to Roger. Um, after your point, Ignacy, about uh, the um, publishing system falling apart, does it, or or, or is it still there lingering, not allowing new types of publishing to come out there. Thank you. Um, can I make a distinction between book publishing and journal publishing? I, I, have, been, yes. I have been involved in both. Book publishing, um, you invest in a book and uh, 18, 24 months before you get any money. In journal publishing, exactly the opposite. Um, you get your money before you actually publish the journal. Um, and that has been the um, the historical way. Um, so the cash flow of both are very different. 
and uh, journals, to my surprise, when I first came in uh, 12 years ago, were extremely profitable uh, comparative to books. And th this was scholarly publishing. Um, so sustainability is absolutely at the center of both uh, books and, uh, and journals. And sustainability um, comes about from having security of knowing where your income is coming from. And uh, so uh, this is again why I turn back to John Walensky's um, uh, way of handling this um, through the libraries. It would give journal publishing um, a open uh, possibilities of being open. And secondly, it would provide a sustainable solution to a problem which particularly social science publishers, um, when they go open, don't have. Um, or in my experience, don't have at this moment. Thank you very much, Roger. And, and I think this is, again, important to emphasize that uh, not all publishers are the same, not all types of publishing are the same, and, and we need to see uh, how these actually work. But still, reform may be required in order to be able to allow these different models to flourish. So uh, heading, getting back to you, Rod, uh, in, in relation to, to the same question, uh, to what extent can we achieve sustainability in the current context, in the current time, to go back to your point? I, I love how big this topic is. It's, it's almost nothing is, is not in scope for it almost. Yeah, yeah um, it's, it's crazy, crazy yeah. big. <laughs> um, yeah, so fantastic points been raised by lots of people. I agree with what you were saying, Ignacy, um, at the end there. Um, and Thomas, one of your points, um, you know, the and you just said a very similar thing, Prodro. Um, the, the publishers are somewhat different. You know, there are kind of some publishers tend to behave in similar ways to other publishers. There are definite groups of publishers who behave differently to other publishers. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was what I would phrase research focused publishing. Um, and certainly for a publisher like us, for a learning society publisher, that's what we're interested in. Um, and that is is publishing, you know, research publishing, which is about what facilitates scientific communication. That's the sort of primary role of it. And the, the characteristics, you know, I, I would attribute to research focused publishing are public publications that are free for authors and free for readers as a first point. You know, so fair for everyone. Um, they should be equitable models. I, you know, the point about equity has come up many times. Elia has been making this. Various people have been making this. They should be trustworthy. You know, this is very important. They should be good science. There's an awful lot of um, indifferent science published. There's kind of salami slicing. There's there's not very good papers. We we do want the good science to to be visible and to be found. Um, they should be rapid so the research gets out into the community quickly, um, and they should be affordable. You know, that's what research focused publishing looks like for me. And I say there's various forms of this that already exist. Diamond Open Access we've talked about is um, is definitely in that research focused publishing uh, model. Preprint servers <laughs> and subscribe to Open. You know that's a that those are all mo uh, models that fit that description. I'd say some of what's happening in terms of how Open Access is being uh, rolled out in practical terms is different. And a lot of what's going on with libraries at the moment is they're signing something called read and publish transformative agreements with publishers, very often with very big publishers. And essentially they will say, be spending a large amount of money with a large publisher and they will turn that spend, which has been for access to journals into an open access fund uh, for the university. And it will cover the equivalent of the APCs for that university, that university's researchers to publish open access. So it's kind of replicating the APC model, and it brings in the iniquity that's within the, the APC model. And I think for me, it also reproduces some of the, the market power that exists with big research publishers at the moment. Um, it's, it's, you know, we, you know, we're a 14 person team at IWA Publishing. We have just signed the fourth read and publish agreement we have um, with Australia and New Zealand with Call. Um, each one of them takes months of discussion to finalize the agreement usually take years to get to the point where you can sign them if you have a staff of seven thousand people 
around the planet, you can get through those agreements quicker. And that is what's happening. And, and that's rational because libraries have spent lots of money with big publishers and they want that money to deliver open access. And this is the immediate way to do it. Um, but one of the, the concerns is that it replicates the, the market dynamics of, of where we've been for 20 years, you know, which is about big publishers having a lot of negotiating power and not necessarily compatible uh, goals to what the research community has. So one of the things I think is missing from that picture is, is equity and how equity actually gets, um, gets brought into the equation. Um, and a, a, a different group to anything we've talked about so far that I'm I'm involved in is a group of North American librarians who are working on something called Library Partnership, um, which is essentially trying to formalize what does equity look like and how can you evaluate publishers in terms of equity. And it's meant to be a tool to help librarians make decisions. So they have they have budgets to spend, they want to do the right thing by the university, um, they want to get value for money. Um, very often they have specific remits to deliver open access, so to spend more money on open resources. This is very normal for many universities in Europe and in North America now. Um, and they have aspirations to deliver equity, but no mechanism for really understanding what that looks like in practice. So this is a, an attempt to give a tool to librarians that helps them bring those equity decisions in. Um, and I think if you bring the equity dimension in, that kind of research focused publishing um, makes much more sense and it's much more compatible with, with the library um, community, and it provides a much better basis for moving forward. Um, if, I, if I talk a little bit about some things I've already mentioned, um, we're having a, a very good experience with Subscribe to Open. Um, you know, just to give some, some quick data, in the first year we had the Subscribe to Open model on our 10 journals, the, the number of article downloads increased by 109%. Um, a lot of that increase in downloads came from the established countries that we have always worked with. So we doubled usage in, in the US and we doubled usage in Germany. We had 60% increase in usage in the UK and 60% increase in Canada. And now we're seeing citations in the first year after um, the change. And we're getting something like two and a half to three times as many citations as the year before the change. So we're seeing much better outreach many more um, downloads and in particular we're seeing more downloads in the global south which for us international organization that really does matter to us so we're doing a much better job of research publishing you know so we're kind of we're delivering on the on the message here what we like about s2o is it's a perennial model it keeps going forward as long as we can get libraries to support us um, and we can bring some money in from other sources it works one of the the challenges you have with for instance diamond open access is that it really does depend on short-term funding so even if there's a genuine commitment if that commitment ends um, then it doesn't become possible to do the diamond open access publishing and one example of this one cautionary tale is a journal called housing policy debate um, which is still a very good journal it was one of the best journals in the housing field um, entirely funded by the um, the freddie mac um, organization in the us which was very caught up in the 2008-2009 recession and had massive reduction in its funding available um, and it had been a diamond open access journal for 20 years abruptly stopped because the funding stopped and became a subscription journal and it's a subscription journal now and what it was was a brilliant journal but it's it's quite a good journal now it's, it's changed its status and I would be very cautious um, about the fact that it does it does still cost quite a lot of money to publish good research and to and provide the, the useful filtering that peer review does so that good um, and verified research um, is what is disseminated to researchers in easily usable forms in rapid, um, in rapid time. Um, and to do that, what is needed is, go back to what I was saying before, a researched focused publishing model, um, which has genuine long-term viability. It can keep going, it can keep sustaining. And, I think um, echoing points already made, I think to to help that system become a dominant element of the the, system, the situation we're in now, rather than the commercial solutions which are more configured around the transformative agreements, I think um, that we need librarians and funders and progressively minded publishers to come together and work out how can we develop systems for generating that kind of that kind of researched 
focus publishing for enabling it to be funded for making sure that the money that is spent on that system delivers good outcomes for science it delivers equitable outcomes um and there's a basis for that carrying on i think this is very much the kind of space that, that john's proposal is in mm. um john's proposal is very much formulated around copyright but i think there are also practical collaboration um mechanisms that can deliver a similar outcome and perhaps these are two faces of the same solution at different moments in time you know awesome. they may be entirely yeah. compatible i'm um, sorry I, that's I a very long answer to your question but no 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 but but it has been quite co comprehensive and i think it's yeah. as we're reaching the conclusion of the uh, of the workshop today it also gives us some leads to the next one uh, where we're going to have the opportunity to discuss uh, john's proposal a bit more uh, as well as in the third one yeah. uh where we're going to to discuss the different uh options that we were off have been offered uh collectively uh, but um i need to pass now to roberto and and roberto also uh you talked about the uh the risks uh, you wrote about the risks of big deals uh with publishers and and what it would mean for open access and um also i need i see that you have also this discussion with thomas hartman thank you for your uh uh question um in relation to the um u.s policy the biden model um john has also responded to to the same threads can you tell us a few things about what do you think about the so this is more the next seminar but to what extent do you think uh we can learn from the uh, uh white house policy the ostp one uh which actually was issued uh recently and what does it mean what can we learn out of this if, if anything at all I think we can learn about um, something about uh, the zero embargo policy. Uh, John Wilisky uh, uh, is discussing um, this uh, uh, policy option. From my point of view, is uh, is very uh, it is natural thinking about uh, a zero uh, embargo policy because. Uh, I, I don't understand what is the rationale of, uh, um, of an embargo period. If I receive uh, um, a public funding uh, from, uh, from the state or from uh, the public sector as a researcher, I have to publish immediately my uh, research output because I have uh, a an obligation uh, uh, to the public in this sense. And at the same time, I don't receive for a, a scientific article a, a, a monetary compensation from the publisher. So the, the noble uh, rationale of uh, copyright uh, linked to the, uh, the idea of uh, an autonomy uh, granted by the market, uh, an autonomy of the author granted by, by the market, he doesn't work in the in the scientific sector in particular for scientific articles so i i think uh, as uh, also the alia uh, document mentioned by uh, alia before uh, i think uh, the, if we are um, thinking for example uh, a, a, about a, a right to open uh, scientific publication we we have to frame the, this right in terms of a zero embargo because the, and at the same time we have to frame the right in terms of the right to publish with the open licenses and if we if we are in a, a capitalistic system based on the market the market will decide what will be the best and uh, uh, sustainable uh, model. Uh, we don't have to discuss a lot about uh, the best model because we have, we have to guide uh, the system in uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, in a direction in a certain direction. I think that the most important thing is uh, from uh, uh, the university and researcher. Um, sector is uh, uh, to discuss the sustainability of the our system and from this perspective this uh, uh, current system is not sustainable as uh, uh, many speakers said before me um, and uh, why this, when you talk uh, about our system sorry Roberto when you talk our, about our system, our system even our, 
uh, our current system based on the big deals and uh, okay. uh, and yeah. transformative agreements uh, in in particular transformative agreements as for example the uh, the um, the alia documents uh, said okay. Okay. Uh, uh, is not sustainable because uh, the idea was at the, uh, the beginning of the story reducing the cost but uh, uh, we are uh, not reducing the cost of the the uh, the agreements at at the same time we um, we are not reducing the monopoly power and this is the the most important problem because this monopoly power is linked not to to a, a publishing system in a strict sense but in a, in a, it is linked to uh, 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 data analytics uh, business model completely different from the traditional uh, publishing system so uh, from my point of view the, the most important uh, thing uh, to discuss is this uh, this one from the the perspective of, of uh, researchers and uh, research institutions university the most important point uh, is about uh, the sustainability, monet, economic sustainability of uh, our system, but also the uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, of academic freedom, freedom and autonomy. In in fact, there is a discussion in this uh, in these last years about uh, about the academic freedom and autonomy. For example, the the, the famous uh, um, uh, statement of. Uh, Karen Max, former rector of the uh, University of Amsterdam uh, one year ago, about the, the risk linked to the, the growing power of commercial entities uh, uh, linked to the communication, uh, communication system in, inside the science sector. Thank, thank you very much, Roberto. And some... Um, uh... I just going back to the questions that were mentioned, were posted on the chat box, and I'll open now the floor to even more questions from the audience. Um, the the question of supporting uh, uh, open science is not just a question of uh, legislative measures or uh, business models, but is also a question of infrastructures and practices. Uh, and as Enrique uh, Wolf, if I pronounce the name correctly. Uh, mentions um, the cost of such infrastructure are uh, can be immense, uh, and especially when the practice are not practices in terms of how we uh, perform open science are not uh, at least somehow uh, standardized, or we don't have interoperability between different systems. Uh, we uh, we can we tend to have a lot of uh, costs that someone has at the end of the day to pay. Um, so going to this question and asking Alia. Uh, to what extent do you see infrastructures, uh, infrastructure policies in Europe to um, uh, to be um, um, uh, in, in the way in the way we see these kinds of uh, questions and the, the kinds of issues? Uh, to what extent do we see um, the infrastructure question as something that can be resolved? Uh, by uh, the different European policies. We have sustainable effort for more than ten, two decades on this question. Alea? Alea, can you hear me? Does it work now? Yes, now it works. Uh, okay, sorry, because I was having some some problems. So yeah, I missed the, the last part, Brother Ramos. You were asking about research infrastructures? Yeah, in, in, in the sense of research infrastructure supporting open science, to what extent uh, do we see this uh, being uh, something which has a cost? And to what extent can this cost be uh, supported uh, in different ways through European policies? Uh, and if I understand also right, the question uh, set by... Uh, and Rick Wolf in relation to uh, copyright metadata in particular. Um, so uh, we have this question. Um, and I don't know if uh, Enrique would like to further elaborate on, on, on this uh, position he made initially. 
Um, so even public domain uh, material, it still has, if I understand the, the point correctly, it still has a, um, uh, a cost and somehow this is to be addressed. Yes, I think it is suggested from, from methods of the copyright that uh, uh, to support the construction of multi-field data is to open and applicate new scenarios and construct the data factor market according to EU categories and levels will go to enhance the development of utilization of the value of data. It's mostly what I see the requirement of uh, metadata is um, to be enforced. I don't know if if anyone would like to make a statement or respond to Enrique's point. If if I may, Pro, I think uh, yeah, uh, I think what Enrique just pointed out here, we, and you mentioned with infrastructure, is also key. I think if we want to to build uh, the the open science, we need also to have uh, open infrastructures uh, built and ruled by the community, so by all the stakeholders, uh, and. And I, I think, and somebody mentioned before, the library uh, needs to spend or has a budget. I think we have to go beyond the library. I mean, this all this issue of open science is not a library business. Is a, a whole. If, if now I'm taking the institutional hat, for me, is a whole for the institution. I mean, research has, has always been understood as also publication is a part of research. So it, we cannot rely just in the past uh, only with the library and say, well, this is library budget. No, this is research budget. And I think we need to take uh, in this into account. If we want to support open science, all the institution, especially sometimes we forget that this is research and therefore we need to, to uh, commit to have all these open infrastructures because the case that Enrique was mentioning, if, if we have metadata, if we, you mentioned public domain, we also need to put all these tools in infrastructures that we can manage, that we can keep, and also that can be sustainable. We focused before in the sustainability of this publishing system, but of course we need to make all these infrastructures sustainable because if not, also we'll miss this idea of uh, keeping the open science and all these uh, items uh, in an open way. And also, of course, we don't have time now, but we can also discuss about open education and other open things that makes at the end uh, all the ecosystem of the open science, or we might say also open knowledge. And uh, I'd also like to pass the floor. I don't know if Thomas Hartmann wants to actually uh, ask a question the same way Enrique does. We, we discussed a bit before uh, this kind of question, to what extent, uh, we we learn from the uh, what can we learn from the OSTP uh, zero embargo policy and uh, Roberto was quite uh, uh, gave quite a, an extensive answer to that but I was wondering whether Thomas um, Hartman would like to make a further comment or question. Guess yeah. not. Yes. If I may, uh, sorry, I, I I don't know what happened. I lost the connection, but now I'm back. Uh, now, with regard to the U.S. policy, so I think indeed it is to be welcome and is is very good. But uh, as a funder, I think maybe I'm too optimistic about the the policy. What we have in the European Commission, but we have a, a very a more ambitious policy so far until we know the details of the U.S. So what we know. Until now, it's public access, but we don't know yet about the licenses. In the European Commission, we ask not only immediate open access, but under open licenses via trusted repositories, no matter whether they publish in an open access venue or not, but via repositories, trusted repositories, with sufficient copyright retention to meet the mandate. And then that our funding uh, goes to full open access venues when reimbursing APCs. So, uh, yes, I would be interested in, in knowing more about uh, how this could uh, be a model in many aspects, of course, but I would say for the details we have so far, uh, the European Commission policy via Horizon Europe is quite ambitious in that regard. 
Mm -hmm. and, and and going to another question by thank you very much, Alia, by Yeren Bosman. Um, uh, what is being asked is whether it's a better question to ask who is organizing the publishing, the publishing instead of what business models we could use uh, to marry commercial publishing with open access. And um, uh, Yaron also suggests uh, uh, seeing what happens with uh, uh, projects like Diamas. Uh, so how uh, higher, uh, higher education institutions could provide themselves the platforms and the means for publishing. And so I don't know if uh, uh, someone from uh, the panel would like to take this question, uh, perhaps Thomas. Yeah, my hand was uh, for a follow up on what Alea said. I mean, I think that the right proportion uh, is to say that uh, the American initiative is inspired uh, by what uh, we have in Europe. Um, but this doesn't exhaust the question because one thing is to say you have to op to publish in open access, but as long as you can uh, employ models such as hybrid open access, then we know the consequence that this leads to, and and then uh, the, this kind of short circuit, right? Where, for example, you have very high APCs uh, which introduce elements of. Uh, uh, inequity as it has emerged from uh, what uh, from the previous discussion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, the, the the problem is not just uh, the corporate reform; is a reform that has to touch upon, as we said, all these elements. Uh, the infrastructure is important, and I think that the conversation that is happening right now in the European Union about uh, uh, digital sovereignty. Uh, especially with regard to universities, is at the core of this. Um, and uh, I, I'm not sure, but I think this was said by Roberto at least 10 years ago. Uh, and if not, I'm sorry for putting words in your mouth, Roberto. But it was uh, when we first noticed that, uh, uh, you know, the, the email system of universities was switching from the not so good uh, uh, in-house version to basically the two major platforms, right? And uh, we were wondering, isn't this exactly what happened decades ago with publishing? So as universities, we kind of realized, or maybe we were lazy, maybe we didn't have enough money, maybe, you know, research is more important. So we kind of outsourced our assessment to a business, which is the publishing industry, uh, and to a certain extent may even be reasonable, but we we arrived at a level where as a university is, a university, sorry, we are unable to assess our own activities if a journal doesn't tell us that we have, uh, you know, this much impact factor. Uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but depending on the country where we are, not even so much if you know, and many of us know how academic assessment is performed. But it's also true that the other way, let's say the model existing in the UK, for example, so the REF, where we actually assess among peers the scientific output of our universities is very costly because it means that uh, you know uh, um, us, the acad academic body, has to dedicate a certain substantial amount of time in reading what others have uh, written, which, you know, you could say, well, that, isn't that uh, one of the core objectives of uh, research? Yes, it is. Uh, but of course, we are at a certain level of specialization that this is not always uh, easy. Um, so it, there is a, a, a question of costs, and these costs, if there is enough uh, uh, transparency, are certainly costs that uh, may, be, may very well be paid to an external entity that offers this service. Um, but there needs to be certain uh, requirements, certain guarantees that, uh, you know, th this, uh, this uh, is still done uh, in the core objective of university, which is a public interest uh, 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 goal. So we cannot uh, pretend that uh, a firm that is driven correctly, because a private firm must have, must be driven by private economic incentives, we cannot really pretend that they uh, adopt uh, a different met meter to assess uh, um, dynamics from the one that drives their economic activity, right? This simply doesn't, doesn't compute. It's, it's self-contradictory. 
And this, I think, is one of the major questions that we have to, to assess. And it's a question that touches upon all the points that we have made, right? How to find the right regulatory approach that considers uh, the infrastructure, the assessment, the models, uh, the added value that uh, at least the uh, publishers that are here today certainly bring. <laughs> And uh, and the discards uh, the 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 parts that are not uh, uh, not uh, um, compatible with this model any longer. I think that's the the real question. That yeah, uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, I, I think I think it's in the cracks of the of the whole matter. I'll I'll pass. And I think this is the the question is it has multiple layers, as you mentioned, Thomas. It's not just when we say publishing it, we black box quite a few things. Uh, and, and we need to see the different layers. Uh, I'll pass now to Ignacy and Rods for a very quick last comment for you know, for me to wrap up and close the session. No, Ignacy, just first to you and then to Rods. Yeah, very quick one just to answer your own. Uh, I fully agree what he just uh, write in the in the chat. And and I think it was one of the different uh, venues for the future that I mentioned before. I mean, uh, it, maybe if we change the way, as Thomas was saying, on how we assess and how we assess quality of research outputs, this solution that he is just uh, offering in the chat would be one of the venues uh, of possible venues to disseminate uh, the research outputs. Thank you very much. And Rod, to you. Lovely. Yeah, I'm just going to make a, a final comment. So and I, I would say we're in an age now of collective solutions. And I think that's very different from perhaps two decades ago when that wasn't the case. With S2O, there's a community of practice has formed. It's a very constructive, very collaborative group. It involves lots of librarians, lots of S2O and S2O interested publishers and some funders. Um, it's been a brilliant forum for evolving policy and for solving problems around um, S2O. Um, I would suggest if we want to achieve equitable open science, and if we want to move to a system where we have researched focused publications, um, we should bring together librarians um, and funders like the EC, like other funders in Coalition S um, and progressive publishers, and we should sit down, sit down together and talk through these issues. I think there's a great deal um, of practical benefits and practical progress towards open science that can be achieved by willing um, partners who are embedded in the system, who have common interest and who work together. I think you know now is a different moment from where we were at the turn of the millennium. And I think there's there's a great deal that can be achieved simply by discussing um, these issues with the right people in the room. Thank you very much, Rods, and thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Uh, uh, we have had so many different options as to how we can move forward. Some of them more radical, some of them uh, more incremental, but all uh, toward the same direction, which is how can we uh, seek uh, reform in different ways in order to support something which is our uh, daily life uh, as academics, as publishers, as librarians and as universities. Um, so uh, at this stage, I would also like to thank everyone that has participated with questions and by being here and uh, to remind you that this is only the first in a series of webinars in relation to copyright reform and open science. Uh, this is indeed uh, top priority uh, for us as open air. And uh, I hope that we can uh, continue uh, sharing with, with you our thoughts and uh, listen to yours as well. Next seminar is going to be about US um, and uh, John Wilinski uh, will be there. And I'm also very thankful to him for initiating this series. And um, I'm looking forward to see you all and even more in the next webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good night, Thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Uh, Athena, Athena can, you, can you announce when is the next date there for the next seminar? The next seminar will be on the 19th of January. I will share the link here as well for everyone. And this will be sent out to all participant, uh, participants and registrants anyway. So we're looking forward to seeing you there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye.